Today we're going to be going through our level 1 spell tier list for BG3. We're going to be going through every single spell, and I'm sure everybody in the whole universe will definitely, totally agree with me. So let's go through what each tier is. So first off, we have the S or the 20 roll tier. These are going to be spells that every single time you use them, they're going to be clutch. They're going to be defining a battle. They're going to be saving lives. These are going to be your fantastic top tier spells. After that, we have A. These are spells that can be build defining, that can define a lot of battles. These are spells that every single time you use them, you're going to be getting the result that you expected. B tier is going to be your solid spells. There's nothing wrong with these spells. You're probably going to have a few of them. You're going to carry them into battle. When you use them, you're going to be happy with the outcome, but they're not going to always be build defining or battle defining like some of the spells above it are. As we move into the lower portion of the tier list, we have our C tier. This is what I'm going to call the take it or leave it section. If you have it and you use it, it probably isn't going to hurt you. If you don't have it and you don't use it, it's probably not going to hurt you. So that's why the C tier is the take it or leave it tier. After that, we have the D tier or the six roll tier. This is the spells that if you do use them, there's probably going to be better options. Basically, at this point, every spell in the D tier is going to be outclassed by something above it. There will almost always be a better option. There will never really be a situation where this is the ideal spell that is perfect for the spot. These are just sort of mediocre spells that are outclassed by everything above it. And then the F tier are spells that if you use them, you are wasting a spell slot. There's not going to be a ton in here, but the spells that are in there, they're just outclassed by other spells, other items, other methods. They're just constantly outclassed. So let's get started. Starting off our tier list, we have Animal Friendship. Now this spell is uh, might be a candidate for the worst level one spell, so I'm going to go ahead and just slide it into the F spot. It allows you to convince a beast not to attack you. The creature must have an intelligence of three or less, and if you attack them, they will not like you anymore. It is a wisdom save, and um, I, I just I don't think it's good. This is sort of the beast counterpart to Charm Person, um, but the problem being that the classes that learn it are Bard, Druid, Nature Domain Cleric, and Ranger, which all learn Speak with Animals, which is a ritual spell, which means it should always be on, which allows you to just use your standard charisma as opposed to forcing a wisdom save. You also have the option to animal handle or use a potion of speak with animals, which gets you kind of the same solution. And I will just say that I don't think that there's a ton of times where not fighting a beast is even an option. I feel like most of the times when you encounter a beast, you're just going to be fighting it. Or in very specific cases like the owl bear, you could just use animal handling or talk to it and completely avoid wasting a level one spell slot. So this is going to go into the F spot. That's followed up by Armor of Agathis. This is funny because this is the exact antithesis of Animal Friendship. I'm going to move this up to S tier because it is excellent from the moment you get it all the way up to six level spell slots. It's a fantastic spell. What does Armor of Agathis do? You can gain five temporary hit points and deal five cold damage to any creature that hits you with a melee attack. It only costs a level one spell slot and is exclusive to warlocks, draconic bloodline sorcerers, and lore bards, or just bards with magical secrets in general if you'd want to use them. The nice thing is that it does not use concentration. You're getting more bonus uh, HP, so you get more frontline survivability or just survivability in general. And when you take damage, you're dishing out damage back to the enemy. So that just means this is a fantastic first level spell. But the thing that makes it S tier is that it scales fantastically. So you get an additional five hit points and an additional five cold damage with every level, which means if you upcast this with a fully leveled wizard, you're doing 25 uh, damage when somebody hits you and you have 25 extra bonus HP and the damage is set, which means that if somebody does 10 damage to you twice, you do 25 damage to them twice meaning that this spell is just utterly fantastic, should be used on every Warlock. And since it is a level 1 Warlock spell, maybe not the worst idea to dip Warlock in some of your casting classes just specifically to get this spell. That's followed up by one of my least favorite spells, and that is Arms of Hadar. This spell does 2d6 
necrotic damage in a 3 meter or 10 foot radius around the character and prevents reactions on a failed save. And that is a key note here because it is only on a failed save that it prevents reactions. I'm going to go ahead and move this to the D tier and that's for a couple reasons. The first one to note is that necrotic damage is one of the most resisted damages in the game. The reaction, uh, it only takes the enemy's reaction away on a failed save, which means that if you were to try and use it as sort of a disengage with a little bit of bonus damage, it's not going to work for you half the time or more, depending on your spell save DC. And it kind of contradicts the way that you want to play a Warlock. This is a Warlock-specific spell, and it does damage in an AoE around yourself, meaning that you need to be surrounded by characters to get good damage out of it. Theoretically, if you were surrounded by five characters, you would want to, you could use Arms of Hadar and do, you know, 10d6 or whatever it is to all the characters that it hits. But if you're surrounded by five characters, you're probably going to want to do something else to get the F out of dodge. Next up, we have Bane, which is probably going to be my first B slot. So what does Bane do? You can target up to three characters and it is an additional character per spell slot that you upcast this, and they receive a 1d4 penalty to attack rolls and saving throws. So this is a nice um, early game spell to pick up to debuff the enemies. I, I think the main problem with Bane is that there are just better options. Now being able to target three enemies is nice, or additional enemies with upcasting is nice, but it does take your concentration, which means it's going to have to compete with things like Bless. Uh, and, th and that will we'll kind of always knock it down to this B tier for me. Secondary problem, and maybe the reason that I don't particularly use it, is that this is a spell that gets worse the better you do, meaning that if you target three characters with this, with this spell, every time that you kill one of those characters, this spell essentially becomes inactive on that character. It goes away. You lose the benefits, as opposed to something that targets yourself, or your own team, which you kill a character and you just get to move on to the next character and maintain the benefits. So not a bad debuff, especially saving throw debuffs early in the game, but not the best spell either, so we'll leave it at B. And Bane is gonna be followed up by its counterpart in Bless, one of the best spells in the game. I'm gonna go ahead and move that right up to the S tier here. What does it do? You bless up to three, three creatures uh, within a 30-foot radius, they gain a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, and you can upcast it to target an additional character per spell level. Although you probably won't have to do that, and that is actually one of the strengths of Bless. So early game, this is going to help you get a lot more hits and have a lot more survivability against enemy spells, and it also helps with maintaining that concentration if you cast it on yourself. But the real reason that Bless shines is because it is extremely cheap. It is effective at level 1 and maintains that same effectiveness. It's never bad to have a bonus to attack rolls and saving throws. But it maintains its extremely low barrier to entry all the way to the end of the game. Generally speaking, you're not going to have more than 4, 5, maybe 5 or 6 characters if you summon them. But generally speaking, you're, you're traveling with your party of 4, we'll say 5 for an additional summon. So a level 2 or level 3 spell slot for Bless is going to bless your whole party, including yourself. So everybody has a bonus to those saving throws. You're not going to lose concentration because you have a bonus yourself. Everybody hits more frequently. It's just the premier buff spell for your entire team. Moving onward, we have Burning Hands, which is going to be our first quality offensive spell so far. I'm going to go ahead and put that up in the B spot, and we'll talk about why. What does Burning Hands do? For a level 1 spell slot, you get 3d6 fire damage halved on a dex save in a 5 meter or 17 foot cone in front of yourself. So what are the positives for Burning Hands? It's learned by Sorcerer, Wizard, War Fiend Warlocks, Light Demand Clerics, and Draconic Bloodline Sorcerers, as well as Arcane Tricksters and Eldritch Knight Fighters. So it is available to almost everybody, which is great. It only costs a level 1 spell slot, which is also nice, and has fairly good damage. 3 to 18 damage as a level 1 spell slot, I would say, is thumbs up damage. B damage. So where does it separate itself? It's that AoE effect. The cone in front of yourself allows you to get 2, 3, maybe 4 if you're really lucky, characters that you can damage in one turn, and any time that you can do 6, 9, or 12 d6 of damage, 
in one turn. It's fantastic. It is a wonderful opportunity to do AoE damage early in the game, and the only thing keeping it from being higher is the fact that its range is... You gotta be right next to people. Most of the time you're gonna be a caster, so you don't wanna be right next to people. And fire damage is often resisted. That's followed up by charm person. You can charm a humanoid to prevent it from attacking you. You gain advantage on charisma checks and enemies have advantage on saving throws against being charmed because they're already pissed at you. You can target people within 60 feet and it's learned by just about everybody. This spell, I am going to go ahead and move into the F tier, and that is because of the way that it is implemented in BG3. So in BG3, this spell would be used to get advantage on charisma checks in dialogue. That's what it says in the definition. The problem is, is that there is a cantrip called friend that does exactly that. Does exactly that. So the only effect that this actually has is preventing a humanoid from attacking you which is what dialogue is for and might even be covered by friend as well. But generally speaking, I would say that the spell is not worth burning a spell slot just to get advantage on charisma checks in the late game. You're going to have such good bonuses to your charisma. You're not going to need this and you're going to have friend in the late game too. This, this spell is just vastly overshadowed by friend. So that's followed up by chromatic orb. I'm going to go ahead and move chromatic orb to the B spot, even though I don't use it particularly Often, so what does it do? It's 3d8 thunder damage as you hurl a sphere of ener energy at your enemy, or it is also 2d8 damage of whatever else you choose. So whatever element you choose, you're gonna do damage of that type, and you're gonna create a surface. Thunder does not create a surface, so it gets a little bit of extra damage. It was a weird decision to make thunder more damage, but that's fine. It is an attack roll, which can be positive or negative, depending on the way your character is built, but I think just from a versatility standpoint, I think it probably deserves a B. Being able to cast essentially any element that you want is fantastic. And then particularly the fact that you get it as a level 1 spell, 3d8 thunder damage is not something to laugh at at level 1. So simply from the fact that it does 3d8 damage, you can, you can use it to create all sorts of surfaces or all sorts of elemental effects. I think it deserves a B spot. But... Later in the game, I think that there's a lot, of better, a lot of better elemental options, so it probably falls off. Next up is Color Spray, and this one hurts because I personally love the concept of the spell, but uh, it doesn't come to fruition. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the D spot. Uh, I think this is probably like a C at level 1, and then an F for maybe levels 3 onward. <laughs> we'll leave it at a D for now. What does it do? You can blind creatures up to a combined 33 hit points and you can target them in a 5 meter or 15 foot cone. So why do I personally love this spell? There's no save. It just works. Which I love. There's not a lot of spells in this game that just do that. You're thinking magic missile or you're thinking um, sleep. Those are, kind of the, those are kind of the spells that come to mind that are just auto hitting. But the problem is, is that that 33 hit point threshold gets reached real quick. You're probably only going to be blinding one maybe two people uh, early in the game, and then later in the game, you're not going to be blinding anybody. And in the late game, if they have 30 or 40 hit points, you're probably just going to want to hit them and kill them. There's going to be better options, although I suppose this would be slightly cheaper. Um, but the main effect, the main problem with this spell is that the effect is only for one turn. So blinding a target is a very good effect, but for one turn, I mean, come on. That means that you have to not only be near a target, you have to have them lined up, make sure that their hit points don't reach over the 33 hit point maximum, and then blind them, and then make sure that there's people going after you that can take advantage of it. So it's just a really niche spell, even though it is uh, a spell that requires no save, which is fantastic. Next up we have Command, and I originally thought I was going to put it in A, but now I'm going to put it into S. I think that's probably the appropriate spot for it, so let's talk about why. What, do you, what does it allow you to do? You can command a target to approach, drop, flee, grovel, or halt, and you get an additional target per spell slot. That's probably going to be the key here. With the additional target per spell slot when upcasting, that means that the spell is very good at level 1, and it is very good in the late game because you can essentially tailor it to target however many characters that you want. Secondarily, you're going to get all of that versatility that comes with command. 
you can command a creature to approach and walk into your polearm master. Or if it's something like a mage, you can make them walk towards your your frontliner who's just going to absolutely decimate them. You can command a, a target to drop their sword. Without their weapon, they're going to do one punch damage to you, which is essentially useless. You can command characters to flee, which means that they will provoke opportunity attacks. Or just get them out of the battle, which is awesome. You can command them to grovel, which means that they'll go prone. Everybody's got advantage on them now, which is fantastic. And then Command Halt, I think, is actually quite bad. I probably wouldn't use it. I don't know of a... Oh, actually, you know what? Command Halt is great because you can command a creature to stand still in a already placed CC option that's down there. This does not take concentration, which means that you place something there that damages them. You can tell them, hey, stand right there and take this damage every single turn because you're just standing there and not moving. That's followed up by Compelled to Duel. I'm going to go ahead and move that in the D spot. I don't think that this spell works as effectively as a lot of other ones. What does it do? You can force an enemy to attack only you, giving it disadvantage against other targets. So in theory, you can use it with your paladin to make somebody only fight you and not fight your more squishy characters. It is only a bonus action, so that's some positives there. But it does take your concentration, which I think uh, maybe like 70... It feels like 75% of paladin spells take concentration, so there is just a ton an absolute ton of competition there. And I don't think that the effect is good enough. I think just as a paladin standing next to a character is usually good enough to make them not attack anybody else. They're not going to want to provoke those opportunity attacks. Usually your sorcerer is not standing next to you. So it's not usually something that is, is super important. And I think that generally speaking, uh, something like bless, something like giving everybody else a 1d4 bonus to uh, of radiant damage is probably a better use of your concentration for a paladin. That's followed up by Creator Destroy Rot Water. And uh, I'm a little, I think people are probably gonna not like this one, but I'm gonna put Creator Destroy Water into the C tier. Now I call this the Take It or Leave It tier, and I think this fits pretty damn well. You can choose to call forth rain or destroy a water based surface. It is a level one spell, and it has a range of 30 feet and an AoE of 13 feet in a radius, in a circular radius. So, people who run builds that rely on cold or electric damage being doubled when people are wet are going to love this spell. If you are not specifically using lightning or cold damage, this spell is minimally useful at best. You're not going to use it except for putting out fires or solving particular puzzles that require it. There's not a lot of opportunities where it's a big deal. I suppose you could use destroy water to get rid of some more difficult surfaces. But, like I said, if you're not using Create Water to specifically get advantage by making opposing characters wet, then I don't think that it's really that useful. I suppose you could use it to defend against fire damage, but is it worth using a level 1 spell slot to defend against fire damage when you can just use a spell slot to attack where the fire damage is coming from? It's very situational. I don't think people who aren't trying to min-max the game think that this is a particularly fantastic spell. And neither do I, so we'll put it in the take it or leave it category. And after that is Cure Wounds, which is also going to go into the take it or leave it tier. Now, there's nothing wrong with this spell, but it does seem a little bit of a steep price. What do you get? You get 1d8 healing for the cost of an action and a level 1 spell slot, and it does scale with 1d8 hit points per upcast level. So what's the problem with this spell? It takes an action, which hurts. You could be taking multiple attacks away from characters later in the game. An action is a pretty steep price, and getting 1d8 healing is not enough in my mind to really justify wasting an action on it. If you get 2 healing on a character that's downed, you're just going to go right back down again, and you could get 1 or 2 healing from Healing Word. So a lot of competition on ranged healing. This is a spell where maybe if you want to pick up healing outside of battle, it's not the worst option. You could heal with some of those lower level spell slots. You can use things like specific items that maximize healing. But I think the biggest competition here, other than Healing Word, is probably the fact that healing is really prevalent in this game. Rests aren't hard to come by. Potions aren't hard to come by. You can literally craft tons of healing potions by the middle of the game. And they kind of, there's not really a, a reason to cast this spell other than you want to have a healing character. So if you want to have a healing character, take it. If you don't want to have a healing character, leave it. That's why it's going in the C tier. 
After that's Disguise Self, you can magically change all aspects of your appearance, and it is a free spell, it is a ritual spell. Um, I think Larian billed this as... They sold this spell as something that was going to be spectacular, but I'm going to put it into C tier as well. So that's three straight in the C tier. This can be used in theory to, if you steal something, you can change into a different character. You can get away with the bank heist, I guess, if you try, if you, if you really wanted to. It's good for a role-playing perspective, but I don't think that it really impacts the game very often. Because it's not tabletop, illusions, illusion spells in BG3 really got hit hard and they don't do particularly well. I mostly use this spell to get into tinier spots that I can't fit or to turn into a drow and scare the crap out of some goblins. If you have Disguise Self, it will come up infrequently and be useful. Or if you want to build specifically around somebody who's a shifty character, you can take it. But if you don't have it, you're probably going to find other ways to get through all the problems of uh, like the tiny holes or the goblins, you're going to be fine getting through those scenarios without Disguise Self. So I don't think that you really need this spell. Take it or leave it. After that is Dissonant Whispers. And this is an interesting spell, especially at level 1, because it does 3d6 psychic damage and potentially frightens a creature if they fail a wisdom saving throw. It does scale 1d6 per level, so not great scaling. Uh, but it does have a side effect of frightening characters, which is fairly uncommon at this level to do damage and also cause some other side effect. It is learned by Bards and Great Old One Warlocks, and I'm going to go ahead and toss it into the B tier. I think it's good. I think 3d18 damage at, as a level 1 spell slot is nice. I also think that it doesn't scale particularly well. And I think that frightening characters can be mildly overrated early in the game. I think early in the game, you know what? I lied. Frightening characters is good early in the game, but later in the game, there are a lot better options to frighten more characters at once. So I think that this kind of side effect falls off. It's a good spell. It does solid damage and you get a secondary effect from it, but it's not going to be battle defining. After that is divine favor. Your prayers and power, you with divine radiance. Your weapons deal an additional 1d4 radiant damage. It's only a bonus action, and it does take concentration. Another paladin concentration spell. I am going to put this into the C tier, but, like, barely. <laughs> I personally don't like this spell. This is a spell that I think when you read the description, you go, great. An extra D4 of it. You know what? I'm going to knock it down. I'm going to knock it down to D. When you read the spell, you go fantastic. An extra D4 of radiant damage every turn. But then you look at it and it only lasts three turns. And it is learned by only paladins and war domain clerics. But more specifically, you're probably going to be using this with the paladin. And whenever you talk about paladin spells, you talk about how many of them use concentration. And this one does. So it's competing with all other concentration spells. But more importantly, you're talking about where am I using my spell slots. As a paladin, you're only getting half the spell slots that a full caster would get. And you can always use a level 1 spell slot to divine smite somebody. So you're tossing out d8s of damage, multiple d8s of radiant damage, for 1d4 of radiant damage over 3 turns. It is not a good trade. It is very thematic, but it's just not a good trade when you can always choose to just divine smite. Next up, we have Enhanced Leap, and this is another ritual spell. Um, this is an okay spell to have, but I'm going to go ahead and toss it into the... I'll toss it into the C tier. I think most of the ritual spells are probably going to fall into or around the C tier. You can take it or leave it. This is a spell that triples a creature's jumping distance. Generally speaking, the fastest way to get around the game is to cast this on yourself, and you can jump ridiculous distances ten times in a row and just go very, very far, very fast. But assuming that you're not one of those players that's just trying to jump around the map very quickly, this is just a spell that can be used to traverse the map a little bit better. When there's something you just can't reach, it can be very useful. Theoretically, in battle, you could use it to uh, get vantage points or get around better and attack more people. But it's always going to cost you a bonus action to jump, which is 
fine, it's only a bonus action, but it is still a consistent cost. And if you were to cast it in battle, you would be essentially passing on your turn to cast Enhanced Leap, which seems like you would just be better off attacking or using a better spell. If you have it, you're going to use it to traverse. If you don't have it, you're probably going to be fine. And later in the game, you're just going to have better options to get around. That's followed up by Ensnaring Strike, which I am going to go ahead and put up into the A tier. Um, maybe a little high, but I like it. This is a good spell. Your attack summons thorny vines, dealing weapon damage and possibly ensnaring targets. When they are ensnared, it, they will take a d6 at the start of all of their turns. It costs an action, a bonus action, and a level 1 spell slot, and takes concentration. So it is a steep cost, but here's the saving grace on sort of those costs. The bonus action and spell slot are only used up if you hit, which means if you miss with your attack, you don't have to worry about losing your spell slot, which is great. Kind of like smites in that way where you don't have, you can kind of Pro try and proc it as much as possible and never really uh, lose, lose your resources as quick as you might if you were trying to cast a lot of spells. Upcasting it deals a little bit of extra damage, but I would say that it's generally not worth it. The main reason that I like this spell is because it is cheap and effective. You can use it to lock down a single character while still dealing damage, getting up in their face and attacking them, or at range, and with a ranger you can choose the subclass feature or the class feature <clears throat> that allows you to uh, give your enemies disadvantage on saves against being ensnared. So you can generally in the late game, you can ensnare any one character that you want and just absolutely lock them down, which is a fantastic talent to have, especially for only the cons of a level one spell slot. That is followed up by Entangle. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the B tier, despite its similarities to Ensnaring Strike, and we'll talk about why. What does it do? Vines sprout from the ground, turning into difficult terrain and possibly entangling creatures. So this is a very good early spell to just get creatures entangled or, or, or at least slow them down. If there's any sort of hallway or choke point, you can easily cast this there, and it does only cost a level 1 spell slot. It does take concentration, and the only reason that I have it in the B tier and not the A tier is I think that basically every level of spells above this has a... Uh, slightly better variant of this spell. I'm thinking about Spike Growth, which just does damage when characters move through it, and, and but still creates difficult terrain. It doesn't entangle, but it can certainly end battles when a melee character has to walk through it and take, you know, 25 damage of, of, of whatever whatever it is, piercing damage. So it, it is a very good spell, but I don't think that it is defining in the sense that it's not going to completely win battles like something like Spike Growth or some of the high-level CC spells, but still a spell that you'll be very happy to have. It's followed up by a spell that I don't know if anybody's happy to particularly have, and that is Expeditious Retreat. I am going to give it a D, and I might be ranking it too low because I don't use it very often, but it seems like a very steep cost for what it does. You gain the ability to dash, immediately and as a bonus action on each of your following turns it costs a level one spell slot and it does take concentration so the concept is to be able to get the hell out of dodge as a sorcerer warlock or wizard if you are in trouble you can get very far away the problem is is that it doesn't get you uh, automatic disengage which means that you're still going to be provoking opportunity attacks and it takes concentration which means if you're concentrating on any form of CC spell, haste, anything along those lines, you're going to be overriding it just to run away. And if you provo provoke an opportunity attack, you might lose concentration. So I'm sure that there's a couple really good builds that somebody thought of where you can have your wizard kind of zooming around every turn, blasting away as they have great vantage points because they have spectacular bonus action movement. But it's not for me. So I'll leave it in the D tier as a spell that you probably have better options. After that is one of my recently favorite spells, a spell that, as somebody who's not super familiar with the style of play, I didn't quite understand how great it is until recently, but Fairy Fire is next. I'm going to move it up to the A spot. What does it do? All targets within the light turn visible and attack rolls against them have advantage. So you can get advantage for a level 1 spell slot on multiple targets. This is... It's not saying it on the screen in front of me, but it's this feels like fireball radius um, of an effect, and it is a 60-foot range. However, it does take concentration, so it is, of course, competing with the other concentration spells. 
but early game all the way through to the lake I think this is extremely useful and as a bonus it will make any characters that are invisible inside of it no longer invisible and they will no longer be able to become invisible so it is both situationally useful with invisible characters and consistently useful as a way to get a lot of bonus out of a low level spell slot if you can get advantage on three or four targets for 10 turns you can quickly end a battle making sure all of your hits land I love Fairy Fire now, and that's why it's in the A spot. After that is False Life. False Life bolsters yourself with a necromatic facsimile of life to gain seven temporary hit points. It does not require concentration, and upcasting it will give you an additional five hit points per level. That's great. I would say that this spell is a B at level one and two, and then probably an F after that <laughs> it immediately falls off hard especially in the late game uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move into the D spot at level one and level two especially level one seven hit points might like double your HP at level one so it's very useful but it scales at less than seven hit points per level which is weird so it has kind of weak scaling and then you have competition from similar spells like aid and other ways that you can get temporary hit points. So it falls off pretty hard in the later game. Unless it's your only way to gain temporary hit points, it's probably not worth it. And upcasting it with like a fourth level spell slot, you could probably get a lot more value out of that fourth level spell slot uh, by using it with something else. After that is another ritual spell. We have Feather Fall. I'm gonna go ahead and put this into B tier. Most of our rituals have gone into, into C tier so far, but I like Feather Fall. It makes you immune to falling damage. It's almost exclusively uh, an exploring spell, but the difference between this one and the other ritual spells is that it is an AoE of 30 feet or 9 meters around yourself, and for that reason, almost exclusively, I'm going to make it a B. Long Strider, Hand Sleep, you gotta click 55 freaking times and target every single character, and it takes forever. Featherfall, you do it once, you get everybody, you can jump to where you need to go. This is an actually useful world traversing effect as opposed to the other ones which feel very, very tedious. So for strictly the fact that I love the convenience of it and it gives that same traversing effect that a lot of the ritual spells do, I'll move it up to B. Probably too high, but I like it. After that's Find Familiar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put Find Familiar into the C spot. I think you could kind of, you could survive without it. But if you have it, it's probably better to use it because it is free. It is a ritual spell and allows you to summon one of several characters, including a cat, a crab, a frog, a rat, a raven, or a spider. Or if you're friends with your dog, you can summon him as well, who will override your regular familiar. The interesting thing here is that a lot of the familiars aren't particularly useful. Find familiar cat can be used to distract enemies. I don't find that to be fantastic. The crab's more of a melee combatant, but it's so weak, it's also not that great. The frog and rat have secondary side effects that aren't amazing, but the spider and the raven are quite useful. The spider can use web, the raven can blind characters, but I think for the fact that it's free, and you can get fairly good utility out of it, and you have to think about every single time somebody attacks this, they're wasting an action on your familiar instead of yourself. It's probably, you know what, I'm going to move it up to B. If you have Find Familiar, it's a good spell. They're wasting actions attacking it. They're getting occasionally blinded or uh, hit with the spider's web. The fact that it's, it's free. You can't really argue with the fact that it's free. So any sort of secondary benefit after it's free is just automatically going to start from a higher spot because it costs nothing and can be cast outside of battle. After that is Fog Cloud. This is a tough one because I think... If you're a character that likes to play with stealth, this is probably like an S tier. But if you don't play with stealth, it's probably like a B tier. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in A. What does it do? It creates a cloud of dense fog that heavily obscures and blinds creatures within. It has a range of 60 feet and a radius of 15 feet or 5 meters in a radius. Um, it does require concentration, which is a bit of a bummer, but can be learned by a lot of classes including druid sorcerer wizard tempest clerics sorcerers rangers 
and your melee characters that also learn spells. So it can be learned by a lot of people, particularly Ranger. This can be kind of a secondary spell. It doesn't need to be necessarily on your main caster. I think it has a lot of benefits. It's a great way to break sight lines. You can go ahead and walk into it. Nobody can target you anymore, which is fantastic. You can use it as a way to gain stealth, which is fantastic. Or you can do the very stupid cheesy method that I recently started to like doing, which is if a character uh, is in front of you, you can just cast it so that they're on the edge of it and blinded and you're not blinded, and then you just get advantage on them until their turn comes around and they move away. But when they move away, they'll provoke an opportunity attack, which is fantastic. So they're just kind of blinded, taking taking, this, uh, taking these attacks with advantage for a while. The only drawback is that concentration p piece, but um, as a level 1 spell slot, it's essentially darkness, uh, but for half the price. But I don't think you can really complain about that. That is followed up by Goodberry. Uh, this one's like maybe the easiest choice of the day. I'm going to put it in C tier. Take it or leave it. What does it do? You conjure four magical berries that give you one D4 of healing per berry and can also be used as camp supplies. If you are an extremely meticulous character and, or somebody who wants to make sure that they don't run out of camp supplies, this is the spell for you. If you have a couple extra spell slots at the end of the day, feel free to use this to get some free good berries. But personally... I don't think that it's quite enough healing. And more importantly, I think the prevalence of camp supplies and the prevalence of healing items in the game mean that this, this is more task management and inventory management than it is useful, at least to me. Take it or leave it. You can't argue that it isn't useful. It certainly is, uh, but I certainly do not use it at all. Next up, we have a crowd control spell in Greece. I'm going to go ahead and slide this up to the A spot. Uh, and that is because... Of how well it scales in my opinion what does it do you cover the ground in a flammable grease it becomes difficult terrain and creatures within it can fall prone this is in my opinion sort of the premier early game crowd control spell for several reasons one you're getting that difficult terrain which is great you can just sit back and shoot arrows into people's faces which is fantastic they also might fall prone which is great if you have somebody who's sort of on the edge of that they can they can reach in and attack them with advantage or your arrows are just going to keep piercing into them as they're wasting turns getting up. And perhaps most importantly, it does not take concentration, which means you can layer this in with a concentration spell. You can cast something that does an area of effect damage, and then you can cast Grease. It's cheap, it only costs a level 1 spell slot, and has no changes with upcasting, so there's never a reason to cast it with more than a level 1 spell slot. So I found that in the, late, the mid to late game, this is a great way to still get crowd control when it's sort of a secondary battle and you don't want to waste a lot of spell slots. Only costs a level one spell slot and you got people slip sliding around. Or if it's a big battle, you can go ahead and lay down a concentration spell and then toss grease around it, inside of it, and it will, it will just add to sort of the muck and mire in that choke point and makes a really good secondary effect in big battles. So I'm going to leave grease in the A spot. Next up is Guiding Bolt, and this is a tough one for me because I think early game this is like the premier damage spell or one of the premier damage spells, um, but I think late game it really falls off. What does it do? You do 4d6 of radiant damage by firing a bolt of radiance at your enemy, and also your next attack roll against the target will have advantage. The only problem with this spell, I think, is that it upcasts. Uh, you only get an additional 1d6 of damage when upcasting it, but... When you get it, 4 to 24 damage at level 1 is massive. Nobody's got extra attacks yet. It's humongous damage. And your next attack against a character is going to have advantage. This is sort of the premier early game uh, attack, I think, to use on sort of those more boss-like enemies. You can do a ton of damage to them. And the next attack roll against them has advantage, which, which means it's sort of stacking future damage as well. This is a very good spell, but in the late game, I think that it really falls off. It does not upcast well, and when you get to the point where your cantrips are three dies worth of cantrip damage, you can talk about 3d10 damage from a cantrip versus 4 to 24. Do you really want advantage for one more attack for the cost of a level 1 spell slot? Probably not worth it. So early game, this is probably like fringe S for damage and a little bit of an extra side effect. And then late game, I think it falls back to B. So we'll leave it as a B slot here. 
That's followed up by another spell that does fall off pretty hard in Hail of Thorns. I'm going to go and move that into the D spot, and we'll talk about why. It does weapon damage and then an additional 1d10 piercing uh, in a surrounding area of a 2 meter or 7 foot radius. Early game when you get this. Weapon damage plus 1d10 is nice. When you fight a pack of gobos, this piercing damage might take half, three-fourths of a goblin's health. It can be very, very useful. But I find that at levels 2 and 3, that piercing damage of 1d10 is nice, but it starts, starts to sort of turn into more like chip damage or secondary damage. And then at level 5, this spell will take your entire action. Despite using weapon damage, you cannot make subsequent attacks. Which means, if you have a multiple attacking character, which this is only learned by rangers, so you will, it almost universally becomes better to just make two attacks than it does to spend an action, bonus action, and a spell slot to get 1d10 of extra damage in a very small radius. This is probably a B spell to start, and then an F spell once you get past level 5, so we'll leave it into that D spot. After that is going to be the auto S spell, a spell that allows you to essentially just rubber band this game, and that's Healing Word. I'll plop that up there into the S spot. What does it do? You heal a 1d4 for a bonus action and a spell slot. The kicker here is that it has a 60 foot range and only takes a bonus action. It does scale with levels, but nobody upcasts Healing Word unless they need to. The, the thing here is this spell essentially breaks the game because if a character is downed, you can use a bonus action and immediately get them back up. When a character is downed, they do no damage. When a character has one HP, they do full damage. They do all of their, if it's a fighter, they do three attacks, which means that they're just as useful at one HP as they are at 100 HP when it comes to offensive output. So getting a character from downed to back up without wasting your action means that this spell, you can, you can fight a boss and they knock a character down next turn, you pop them right back up, you're right back in the battle. It's almost free with the, just being a bonus action and a level one spell slot, and it allows you to just rubber band your way through a lot of battles. Add in the fact that in BG3, with healing, you can spread a lot of effects. You can spread Blade Ward with healing. You can spread uh, Bless with healing. So there's a lot of additions in BG3 that make this spell better than it already was, and it already was considered fringe broken. After that, we have Hellish Rebuke, which is an interesting one because I really like it but I don't think it's your most efficient method of dishing out damage as a warlock. What does it allow you to do? You can react to your next attacker with flames that deal 2d10 fire damage or half on a spell save. It does only cost your reaction and it is a dex save. The nice part about this spell is it scales at 1d10 additional fire damage per upcast level. The problem with this spell is that it is almost Warlock exclusive. It is technically learned by Oathbreaker Paladins or Magical Secret Bards, but that seems like kind of a weird decision for a Magical Secret Bard, but you do you. The problem is, is that Warlock spells are so precious. You only get two of them per battle, or three of them if you're at the very end of the game, but you only get two per battle. You really want to use one of your precious spell slots to just do fire damage. I think Warlock spells really need to do a ton of damage to be considered effective. If you add in the fact that Eldritch Blast with Agonizing Blast does not the full damage, but similar damage on a less resisted type of element, I think that this spell is sort of a cool spell to have. I love it thematically. I love the way that it works in the game. It's very nice when somebody attacks you and you kind of just bop them and they go right down. It feels very good to use, but I think that there's a better way to use your Warlock spell slots specifically. After that, we have Heroism, and this is a tough one. I think that when you read it, it sounds like an A, but I am going to give it a C because I just never use it. You can make yourself or a target immune to Frightened, and they gain five temporary hit points each turn, which is nice because you're just kind of consistently regenerating HP, and it's 10 turns, which is a great way to kind of sit in the middle of combat and consistently take damage. The problem here is that it does take your concentration, which means if you're something like a bard, you're not going to be CCing people, or if you're a paladin, you're not going to be putting out more damage or blessing your teammates. So it does have a lot of competition. And I think that the fact that it is concentration really takes away from sort of the concept here. The concept is that you're supposed to be able to stand in battle 
and every turn because of your bravery you can't be frightened and you gain back your temporary hit points because of your vigor but you could just lose you're going to be standing in the middle of the fight if you use this that's kind of the whole point losing concentration is going to be a real possibility so I think it kind of falls off in its usability because of that. But I like it in in its concept. Consistently getting back health every turn is very cool. And if you're fighting a specific character that's going to try and frighten you, it could potentially save you in that battle. But that is very, very niche. So we'll move on to Hex. Hex is a Warlock bread and butter spell, which allows you to tag somebody with a Hex, and they will get an additional 1d6 necrotic damage every time that they are hit as well as getting disadvantage on checks of an ability of your choosing. Uh, checks is not super fantastic, but it can be reapplied. This is sort of a bread and butter warlock spell. I'm going to go ahead and move it up to A. It is strictly A for me because of the massive damage bonus that you can get as a warlock, particularly in the late game. As a warlock, your Eldritch Blast is going to be your go-to move. Every time your Eldritch Blast hit, because it comes out as different beams, you're going to be getting an extra 1d6 of necrotic damage, which means that you can get an extra 3d6 per turn of necrotic damage. The only sort of drawbacks are that it is concentration, and it is necrotic damage, which is resisted, but it's only a bonus action and can be reapplied for free. So if you're going to be a blaster warlock, it makes a lot of sense to just use this in many, many battles, if not most battles, to just add tons of extra bonus damage. Hex is bread and butter for the warlocks. Putting it in A feels right after that is ice knife ice knife eh, is a tough one um i'm gonna go ahead and put ice knife in b i think i forget about this spell in the late game but i think it's tough to argue that it's a good early game spell when you get it at level one so what does it do ice knife does 1d10 piercing damage as well as doing an additional 2d6 cold damage on a failed dex save in a small area of two meters or seven feet. Um, it's an okay early game spell. 1d10 plus 2d6 hold damage is solid for a level one spell. That's going to be a lot more than one weak little, uh, than one dice of cantrip or one weak little weapon attack. So in the early game, it is going to be a nice little damage buff. And the fact that it creates a surface is a huge bonus to it. I think this ability that I don't believe is in the Dungeons and Dragons edition of this. Being able to cast this at a fellow caster that's concentrating, not only do they have the chance of taking damage and losing concentration, but they also have the chance of falling prone on the ice surface and immediately losing concentration. So I think it's a very useful spell. Solid damage, solid utility. The only thing holding it back from being higher is the fact that uh, it scales at 1d6 cold damage per spell slot upcast, which is not great. And that 2d6 can be saved against. So if you're going to do 1d6 damage plus... 1d6 cold damage the damage can kind of fall off sometimes it's not going to do the most damage for you so just a generally solid spell with good useful applications after ice knife is hunter's mark which is sort of the bread and butter for the early game rogue if you're not going to be an ensnaring striker i personally think ensnaring strike is a better move and for that reason i'm going to put hunter's mark in at a b spot what does it do you can tag an enemy and they will receive an extra 1d6 of physical damage whenever they're hit with a weapon attack it is only a bonus action and can be reapplied for free and it lasts until it well the nice thing is that it lasts until a long rest but the the slight drawback is that it takes concentration which means of course it will be competing with other concentration spells like i mentioned in snaring strike in the early game adding an extra 1d6 of physical damage to everybody that you're attacking is just free damage and it's a lot of free damage which is great in the late game, however, I think that this falls off. I think it's probably an S or a fringe S in the early game. In the late game, an extra 1d6 of physical damage, especially when there's ways, a lot of ways to resist physical damage, is going to end up to just piddly little chip damage. I think you'll probably be better off doing things like ensnaring your enemy or using different spells, especially when your equipment can add d4s or d6s to damage on its own. You don't really necessarily have to apply the mark and use your concentration to get that little bit of extra chip damage. After that is sort of the premier damage spell from the level 1 tier, and that is Inflict Wounds. I'm going to go ahead and move that up to the A slot strictly because of how well this damage scales. So at level 1, it does 3d10 necrotic damage 
So you're getting the most level one damage that you can get, I believe, in a single turn. Negatives, it is resisted by a lot of people as necrotic damage, but the positives are too much. For every upcast level that you cast this with, it does an additional 1d10 necrotic damage, which means you're talking about stuff like 6, 7, 8d10 of necrotic damage when you upcast this, which means that it scales spectacularly. If, a, if an enemy does not resist this, this is a fantastic damage spell and will be good, will be great at level 1 and will be very good in the late game. A, a go-to damage spell if you have it. After that is, I think, our last ritual spell, and that is Longstrider. I'm going to toss that in the C spot. Uh, I think this is a fine spell. It gives you an additional movement range uh, of 3 meters or 10 feet, and it is a ritual spell, which means it is free. It does take a very long time to cast, and you do have to reapply it after every long rest, so it's a little frustrating, but it does last until a long rest, so it is just a constant 3 meter buff to anyone you push it, uh, place it on, and you can place it on everybody in your party. I don't think that there's any any reason to not use this except for the fact that it's kind of annoying to constantly use um, but if you don't have it you're not going to really miss it i didn't have this on my first playthrough i didn't know that it, it lasted uh, until long rest and that you could apply it to everybody in your party i thought it was just for one person so i didn't use it and uh i'm going to be honest with you i didn't miss it it's still the same game so i'll put it as a c you can kind of take or leave long strider after that, we have Mage Armor. I'm going to go ahead and toss this into the B spot. Uh, it can be learned by Sorcerers and Wizards, as well as Arcane Tristers and Eldritch Knight Fighters. This is an okay buff spell, kind of the go-to Sorcerer and Wizard buff spell. It changes your armor class base to 13, meaning it's 13 plus your dex modifier. So your Sorcerer or Wizard early in the game will have a 13, uh, a 14 or 15 armor class which is not bad. It will keep them from being a little bit squishy. It's essentially a plus three to AC, and it only costs a level one spell slot, and it does last all day long. It's not useful for a lot of builds, but for the builds, uh, for the spellcasters that use it, or an arcane trickster that just wants a little bit of an extra buff to their defense, for those unarmored characters, it can be useful. So I'll leave it as a B, although in my opinion, it might be the lowest one on the B. It is just Fairly useful, only for specific builds. Next up is Magic Missile. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the A category. And it is essentially for one reason. So what does it do? You get three darts of magical force, each dealing 1d4 plus one force damage. And they can be targeted any way you like. It can be three darts to three different people or three darts on one person. The main reason that this spell is good is because it cannot miss. It hits no matter what, as long as the opponent does not have shield it will always hit there is no spell save there is no uh ac calculation it's always going to hit you do get an extra dart per upcasting level but it only does an additional 1d4 plus one per dart so it's never going to be a great damaging spell but when you talk about a great way to end a battle if characters are getting to the end of their lifespan this is a fantastic way to just take them out it's also a great way to hit a specific character that um does not, that has a very high AC and is very tough to hit, or my favorite way to use it is probably to cast at opposing uh, casters because it will force them to do three or more depending on, depending on the spell that you cast it on, but it'll, it will force them to do multiple concentration checks, which I just like. They're not going to be the toughest concentration checks. They'll just be a standard check, but forcing them to do three of them is very nice. It's a good way to break concentration and fairly cheap or a great way to finish off enemies with guaranteed it's after that is protection from good and evil i am going to go ahead and put that into the d tier and that might just be me that might just be me being like if this spell doesn't damage people it's not good but i don't think that this spell is particularly useful you can protect an ally against attacks and powers of aberration celestials elements phase fiends and undead you also the target can't be charmed or frightened or possessed which is fantastic, and attacks against them have disadvantage. It all sounds so great. It sounds amazing, and there are a lot of Aberration Celestials, Elements, Fays, Fiends, and Undeads in the game. There are a lot of those. The problem is, is that it takes concentration, which means you're not using other concentration spells. And the way that D&D and Baldur's Gate is set up is that the best way to survive is to kill the other stuff really, really fast. In particular battles, this can be useful, 
But if you're using this in every battle, I th you think you're better off just casting a spell that does damage. Maybe it's just me. I'm sure that there's arguments to move it up to C or B, but I'm going to leave it in D here and we'll move on to Ray of Sickness. Ray of Sickness is a 2D8 of poison damage and it has the potential to poison a target. When you poison a target, they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks and it would last for two turns. This spell is not good. I'm going to go ahead and move it to D. First things first, 2D8 damage is not great. We've seen other spells already that do much more damage than that. Inflict Wounds does 3d10, so we're talking about a whole nother die and a higher value die. Guiding Bolt does uh, 4d6, so that's more damage and a higher floor for damage. And a secondary effect that's probably uh, more useful than Poison. The Poison save is a constitution saving throw, so it's going to get saved a lot. But mostly I think that it just doesn't do enough damage. 2d8 Poison damage and it's a damage type that is very often resisted. It's just not enough damage to make it really matter. So we'll leave it at the D spot. Follow that up with Sanctuary. Sanctuary only costs a bonus action, and you can target an ally, and they will not be targeted or harmed by an enemy creature unless it is a stray AoE attack. You can target anyone within 60 feet, and it lasts for 10 turns. I'm going to move Sanctuary up to B. I personally like this spell because if you are downed, and you get back up, you can use bonus action. Uh, you can use your bonus action to cast Sanctuary on yourself and survive. You can also use this to target NPC characters that are stupid and save them from dying, which is fantastic. Um, you can also cast this to protect your casters that are only buffing allies, something like a Blesser or somebody that has laid out um, some sort of team buff. They can be protected and you don't have to worry about them getting targeted. Some of those more squishy characters can really get saved. I like this spell a lot. I think this would probably be near the top of B if I was or if I were ordering them. So I'll I'll leave it there. Next up, we have a Paladin and Tiefling exclusive, and that is Searing Smite. I'm gonna go ahead and move that to the D tier. Uh, what does it do? It adds an additional 1d6 fire damage and inflicts Searing Smite on your enemy, which sounds good, but is actually not that good. It costs an action, a bonus action, and a level one spell slot, and your concentration, which is kind of a killer. And it of course competes with smites as a paladin spell i personally find that 1d6 fire damage is just chip damage and not enough to add uh, to an attack and waste a level one spell slot i also find that the effect of searing smite doing 1d6 damage per turn is also fairly useless just because if you're facing a paladin one-on-one -on -one, doing 1d6 damage uh, per turn is not going to happen you're, the paladin is probably going to kill you in two or three turns you're not getting much fire damage effects from searing smite it also scares, scales poorly with 1d6 fire damage per upcast level. And of course, it is competing with Divine Smite. Would you rather do multiple dice of radiant damage or would you rather do 1d6 of fire, a much more resisted uh, type and also takes your bonus action? So whenever you're competing with Divine Smites, you're usually not going to come out well. <laughs> Most offensive spells aren't as good as Divine Smite. After that is Shield. Shield is going to go right into the S tier. Baldur's Gate 3 kind of made this, this move unbelievable because you can multi-class so easily so you can very easily grab one level of wizard or sorcerer and just pick this up this spell up and grab an amazing armor class buff what does it do as a reaction you can increase your armor class by five it also makes you immune to magic missiles for the remainder of that turn and it is only a level one spell slot which means it's super cheap and a plus five bonus to your ac is huge it basically means that unless you get hit by a critical hit or some massive fantastic attack roll you can basically choose do i want to get hit or not which allows you incredible survivability especially for your squishy characters but like i said completely broken in bg3 because multi-classing is so easy so you can grab one uh, one level of any casting class that gets it and just very quickly get sort of defensively unbeatable speaking of defense after that is shield of faith a much worse defensive spell i am going to go ahead and Give it a D. It is learned by clerics and paladins. It costs only a bonus action and a level one spell slot, but most importantly, costs your concentration. And it, you can give yourself or an ally plus two to their armor class. Plus two to your armor class is good, but it's probably not going to be enough to sort of define the battle. I also find that this spell falls into this weird little wrinkle 
of if you're a paladin, do you cast it on yourself? Probably not, because you're going to be standing in the middle of battle absolutely wearing hits to the face, which means you'll probably lose concentration fairly easily. If you're a cleric, do you cast this and use your concentration on giving a plus two bonus in AC to one character? Probably not. You could just use Bless or any other concentration spell and get a lot more out of it. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to leave it in D. My first playthrough, I thought this spell would be very good. A little bonus to your uh, defensive spells, and I use it as my paladin a lot, and it never really came through for me at all. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it in D. Almost useless, but technically not as bad as the ones that are currently in the F tier. After that, we have Sleep. Put a creature into a magical slumber. Select targets up to a combined 24 hit points. Sleep is like, at level 1, is like the most OP spell in the game. Um, but in later levels, it falls off hard. You get an additional 8 hit points per level to target. So it's going to be 24 and then 32 hit points at level 2 and 40 and so on. The problem is, is that once you get extra attack, or once you get any spells that do any sort of significant damage, if a character has 24 or 32 hit points, you're probably just going to want to kill it. The good thing is that there's no save, and for that reason, I'm probably going to put it in C. There is no save for sleep. If you have the allotted hit points as a character, they just go to sleep for two turns, which means that even if it's the final boss, even if you're in the depths of hell, if the boss has 40 HP, you can put him the F to sleep. So if he is a hard character to hit or a character that is doing a lot of damage, sometimes it is nice to be able to just put them to sleep. I don't think you use it enough, but sometimes it's good to put them to sleep. So I will leave that in C. After that, I speak with animals. I'm just going to put this one up to... Uh, I'm going to put it up to B tier. It's just a ritual spell. It's free. Uh, I'm going to put it in B tier because if you don't have it, I do think that you're missing out on a lot of fun dialogue in the game. It, it, it does make animal handling things easier, but animal handling isn't the hardest thing to pass anyway. There's not a ton of animal encounters that you need animal handling for. But from strictly playing the game and actually having fun, you, it's a lot more fun to talk to animals than it is to not talk to animals. After that, summon Quasit. I'm going to put this in D. The Quasit is not... Strong enough, and I didn't actually want, want this, didn't actually know that this was on the list. This is a predefined list of level one spells, so we're just going to skip over Quasit. Technically, having a summon is always better than not having a summon, uh, but the Quasit is not good, so we'll just move right along to Tasha's Hideous Laughter. I am going to slide Tasha's Hideous Laughter up to A. What does it do? It leaves a creature prone with laughter without the ability to get up. It lasts 10 turns. And is a wisdom saving throw. The creature must have an intelligence of five or more, and they can shake off this effect if it does take damage. So, the reason I like this spell, mm, I'm gonna put it at B. The reason I like this spell is because knocking a single character prone is almost always useful, and you can kind of take your time because it lasts for ten turns. You can kind of take your time getting over to them and whacking them. You can. You can go ahead and attack everybody else and then come back and kind of whack the laughing person, assuming that they don't save at the beginning. The problem is, is that it takes concentration and it does not scale. There's no up upcasting benefits. I thought maybe it might make more sense to implement this. At maybe a level 3 spell slot allows you to target 2 people or a level 3 slot allows you to target 3 people. Maybe upcasting it. If this was something like command where you could target multiple people per upcast level i would slide it into the a tier but as a solid way to a cheap level one spell slot to knock a character out of battle essentially i think it is a good spell and it will prove useful if you take it moving to thunderous smite this is an okay spell i'm going to put it in c because i think it's fine uh, it does 2d8 damage on a hit and only consumes your spell slot on a hit and has the potential to move a character or knock a character 3 meters to 10 feet away and knocking them prone. The idea of knocking somebody prone is nice, but I think the only utility for this is to knock somebody off a bridge, off of a cliff, off of the edge of a building. That's always nice. That never hurts. But I think it kind of falls in this weird in-between area where you could just push them if they're on the edge of a cliff, and that's free. Well, bonus action. Spell slot free. Uh, or you could just divine smite them and do more damage. I don't think that it's ever really a good idea to use any of the smites over the regular Divine Smite. 
but this one does add a little bit of nice flair, and also you can knock somebody off a building with your sword, which never hurts. Speaking of knocking people off of buildings, next up is Thunder Wave, and it is the go-to Blasty Blast Send a Guy Flying spell. I'm going to move this up to B. I don't think that there's anything wrong with this spell at all, except for the fact that it doesn't quite scale perfectly. What does it do? You do 2d8 thunder damage, but the damage isn't really what it's about. It's more about the fact that it is a 17 foot or 5 meter cube, and characters that are hit at it might go flying. This is the go-to spell if you're standing on the edge of a building, standing on the edge of a cliff, standing near any sort of big drop, and you are a caster. You can blast multiple people into a hole in the ground, and it is only a level 1 spell slot, so from, from the second you get it, all the way up until the end of the game, if there's ever anybody standing near the edge of a cliff, or multiple people standing near the edge of the cliff, you can just blast them into a hole and they die. So it doesn't do a lot of damage, but the idea that you can insta-kill people every once in a while makes this a B spot. Next up is Witch Bolt. I'm just going to toss this into the, the F spat, because I, I think that this is one of the least useful spells in the game. It is a damaging spell, but it only does 1d12 lightning damage. It takes your concentration, and in subsequent turns, you can use an action to do an additional 1d12 damage. So not only can you do bad damage this turn, you can do bad damage in the next 10 turns as long as you maintain concentration. The problem is, is that concentration can be used on about a thousand different things, and this might be the worst use of it. And the other problem being that things like Inflict Wounds, which do 3d10 of damage versus 1d12, and uh, Guiding Bolt, which does 4 to 24 damage versus 1 to 12, it's just not enough damage output. You can upscale the initial damage, but you cannot upscale the subsequent action damage. It will only do 1d12 in the future, which means that you have to break your concentration for a one-time lightning damage burst it does scale well at 1d12 lightning damage but this you can almost always be better off i'm not going to say almost always you are always better off doing damage in a different method firebolt the cantrip does 1d10 damage this does 1d12 damage it's just not enough to get done what it wants to get done and lastly we have wrathful smite I am going to put this into the D spot, and that will finalize our chart. This spell does an additional 1d6 psychic damage at the cost of a bonus action and a spell slot on a hit, like all of the smite spells, and it does frighten your target, or has the possibility of frightening a target on a failed wisdom save. Frightened is a good spell effect. They're going to have disadvantage, or you're going to have advantage when attacking them, which is great. But the problem is, is that it is 1d6 damage, and like I said, it does compete with smites. If you're just going to use, if you're gonna use this and frighten a target, instead you could just divine smite and do two rolls of radiant damage. It's almost never useful, and this is one of the problems with BG3, in my opinion. It's almost never useful to use one of the non-divine smite smite spells. It is not a gift that anybody else can learn. This is not something that is subclass specific or race specific. It is just paladin only. It's almost always better to just divine smite. And so I don't think wrathful smite is the way to go. So that is my Baldur's Gate 3 level 1 spells tier list. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Oh, so sweetly let me know in the comments uh, if that's the case, if either of those are the cases. If you are interested in seeing the rest of the levels, tiered out by me let me know this is my first time doing one of these sort of long form talking hen videos let me know how i did in the comments and if you made it all the way to the end please feel free to subscribe if it if it is something that you are interested in i intend on making bg3 and other crpg slash rpg videos going forward and i hope to see you there thank you everybody for sticking to this point goodbye